All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Welcome everybody to another Mass Medic webinar. My name is Nicole Owens. I'm the Director of Marketing Communications for the organization. If you're not familiar with Mass Medic, we are a membership-based trade association that works to bolster the medical device industry in Massachusetts and New England through education, events like this, networking, awareness, and advocacy. Today, I am pleased to bring you um, a great webinar on CDO versus in-house from our friends at Battelle. But before I turn it over to our panelists for today, I just have a few housekeeping notes. This webinar is being recorded and everyone who registered for it will receive um, a copy of that recording to watch on demand. You'll also receive a copy of the slides. Um, we will have time for Q&A as well. So as you're, you're hearing the webinar, if questions arise, please feel free to put them in the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen, and we will do our best to answer those questions as time allows. Now, without further ado, I am pleased to turn it over to our first presenter today, Brittany Barrett from Battelle. She's going to take it away. Brittany. Great, thank you so much, Nicole. Um, and hello to everyone that is joining us on the webinar today. Um, Rick and I are very excited to be here and it's a, a pleasure to present to you this webinar to contact uh, content. So we'll go ahead and I'll start off by sharing a little bit about my background and then continue with the webinar goals before turning it over to my colleague, Rick Brooks, uh, where he'll introduce himself and kick off the webinar content. So a little bit about myself. Uh, my name is Brittany Barrett and I'm the quality system manager at Battelle for the Medical Device Solutions Group. Uh, prior to coming to Battelle, I worked at a medical device contract manufacturing company in the roles of business development as a project manager and also quality management um, with a background in biomedical engineering through my research. Uh, working at Battelle has been extremely engaging and exciting with projects spanning the design and development life cycle across multiple exciting areas. So that's a little bit about myself. Um, I also want to share a little bit about the webinar goals and the webinar objectives. Um, Rick and I have learned a lot through working with so many different clients. And within this webinar, I'm excited to have Rick with me to share some lessons learned, best practices, and thoughts on using contract design and development organizations. Um, as many of us are aware, the design and development of a medical device can be challenging due to the technical complexity. Specifically, you need to think about things like the regulatory environment, risk management, technical device requirements, amongst other factors, such as the available resources that you have and the expertise of the team involved. So to support design and development and work through some of these complexities, uh, many organizations may opt to collaborate with a contract design and development partner, which is where this webinar comes in today. So through this webinar, we'll help you navigate contract design and development organizations, CDOs, um, specifically highlighting considerations for how you could distinguish between contract design and development organizations to find the best CDO that fits your needs. Um, we'll also look at the factors that you need to consider to make the choice between outsourcing to a CDO or insourcing in-house. And then we'll also talk a little bit about the selection, selection process to identify that most suitable CDO partner. So now that we've reviewed the webinar goals, let's go ahead and get started. So I'll let Rick introduce himself and then share a little bit about Patel to get the webinar rolling. Thanks, Brittany. Hi, everybody. My name is Rick Brooks. I am a, a technical leader at Patel in their medical device solutions business. My background is in product development. I've always kind of gravitated towards new products, uh, creating new things, discovering new technologies. Um, my passion is really in technologies and things that help um, advance humanity, you know, things that, that make a difference uh, in people's lives. So um, started out in, in smoke detectors, carbon monoxide detectors in the commercial world, spent about five years in biological agent detection systems for the Department of Defense. And then I went into medical devices after that, which uh, is kind of the best of both worlds. I, I like the, the speed of commercial work and the rigor of medical devices. So the, the two of those come together um, nicely. So I've had a number of different roles in my career uh, across the different organizations, uh, backgrounds in electrical engineering, and I've been with Battelle for 12 years. And coincidentally enough, I was actually an intern at Battelle when I was in college in the late 90s and got to see 
the organization um, as a, a early career uh, person really kind of appreciated what Patel is and, and what they bring to the different industries they serve. So when I had the opportunity um, in 2016 to join medical device solutions within Patel, I was definitely excited about, about it. So let me tell you a little bit about Patel as an organization. So what makes it unique is um, at the core, it's a it's an independent, not-for-profit research and development organization. So it, it was established almost 100 years ago by the will of Gordon Battelle, who said that he wanted to create an institution whose mission was to translate scientific discovery and technology advancement into societal benefits. So we don't have shareholders. Um, we don't have quarterly earnings reports. So uh, we get to do some fun things with with the funding that we bring in, we can reinvest them in our communities, um, which is a big part of, of uh, what we do is specifically in, in STEM education, we fund um, setting up STEM schools to try to train up and, and bring the next generation of, of scientists and engineers and technical folks. Um, so that's pretty cool. Um, Centered around three domains, you've got contract research, which um, primarily based in Columbus, Ohio, there's about 3,500 folks that work in that group. Um, then you have a whole group that's managing Department of Energy Labs and Homeland Security. There's about 40,000 people that work in, in those labs across the country. And then as I mentioned, we've got the philanthropy wing where it's not just limited to STEM schools. Uh, we do quite a bit of employee matching and uh, other philanthropy uh, type of activities around the country and in the different locations that we serve. So really interesting company, um, very unique, as I mentioned. So let me talk a little bit about the history. So I said we're about 100 years old. Um, we started out in metallurgy. Uh, that was Gordon Battelle's background. So it made sense. He, he wanted to invest in those areas. Um, you can see like some of our early discoveries and some of the work that we worked on uh, a lot in the nuclear age with, with uh, nuclear energy, which we're still doing today at Oak Ridge National Lab. Uh, developed the process of photocopying. We have one of the original machines in our lobby uh, that became the Xerox machine. Um, UPC codes, cruise controls, as you can see. So our, our focus has always been in, in that tech advance, advancement realm um, typically from like early inception and, and scientific discovery um, through transition into a product. And uh, we stop at the transition to, to production or manufacturing or commercialization. So you, you won't see Battelle products where we're, um, you know, designing and producing them and, and selling them. That's not really our business model. Uh, we really look to partner with with companies that are, um, you know, the right companies to take them into the into the industries. Um, you've probably never heard of Battelle. It's pretty common. I was at a conference last week in in uh, Vegas, uh, MedTech conference, and it's pretty typical that companies that we interface with have said, "Oh, it's a really interesting company. I've never heard of you." And it's it's because of all of that that I just mentioned. That you know, we do a lot of work in. The Department of Defense or the Department of Energy, um, you know, government funding and, and those those areas of of um, interest. There's not a lot of advertising in that space, right? So you probably haven't heard Battelle from there. And then again, being a not for profit, we don't produce anything with with our our brand on it. Um, we don't do a lot of advertising, but where we do shine is in the technical work and and really word of mouth and our reputation is is um, you know, where we make our mark and, and continue to do great things. So just real quick, a couple of the other fun things. So I mentioned some of these uh, uh, innovations at the top. So we, we also worked on coatings for the modern golf ball, which is kind of a fun thing I like to talk about. Um, the automatic pin setter for bowling alleys, worked on that. Um, and no melt chocolate. So this was a big one that actually the military appreciates. You can you can have chocolate for the troops that are in hot environments or hot climates. So there's a whole list of them. As you can see, our numbers at the bottom. We've touched a lot of technologies, but um, one thing I do want to mention before I move on um, 
is one thing that also makes us unique is we have a lot of smart people, right? And they're working on really creative things and they have a lot of really good ideas. And we have a program that encourages our, our staff to submit their ideas and uh, it can be about anything really. And you can get seed funding. So part of the, the way that we work is we seed their ideas to do a little bit of research. And, and if it's real, it, it gets more funding and it gets more investment. And then we like to find the right partners to, to spin off a company or, or license the tech. Um, so we've got a lot of, of cool things that we get to see every day from the staff that we have. Again, just a little bit of uh, interesting stuff about Battelle. So with that, I'll toss it back over to Brittany. Thanks, Rick. Um, I'll speak just a little bit about the Medical Device Solutions Group. This is the group that Rick and I both are, are housed in. So our group has about 80 dedicated staff to medical device development. And as we alluded to, it's, we span multiple areas, um, areas such as human-centric design, the classic engineering disciplines, and biomedical engineering. So we do span quite a breadth of different types of projects. Um, what makes us unique is our ability to reach and find those subject matter experts. Um, so we look at the rest of the Battelle space and bring in the right, right folks to do the work. We have people across the board that can be pulled in from a physicist side, chemist, data scientist, um, to support really whatever the project needs. So that breadth of, of um, expertise really allows us to uh, be efficient and um, able to do some really interesting work, as Rick alluded to. Um, primarily, our clients are coming to, to Battelle MDS to help them create first-in-class products spanning a wide range of the, the life cycle. Um, our expertise is coming through to be working on complex products that require multidiscipline teams. Um, and because of that breadth that we have at Battelle, um, that is something that we can continue to be successful within. Um, so you can kind of see off this, that previous slide um, just a number of different areas that we're able to um, continue in. So with that, um, now that you know a little bit about our backgrounds and also about Battelle, um, let's jump into the CDO content. So Rick, let's start off with the question of what are some reasons why companies may outsource or consider outsourcing? Yeah, I mean, at the at the core, every company is is trying to design and develop the next best product, right? It's, it's key to their business plans. It unlocks sales, unlocks revenue, profits. You know, you're trying to gain march, market share. That's, that's why you're in business. Um, there's always going to be headwinds and constraints. And every situation is unique. A um, couple examples uh, that are, are, you know, prevalent in day-to-day -day of, of the projects that we work with and the clients we work on or, or with. Um, one of them being a virtual team. So it's a, a smaller footprint company. Maybe they've secured some seed funding to invest in some emerging tech. Um, obviously, the, the funding is limited. It's tied very closely to milestones that are short durations. They need to make progress quickly. They don't have time to, to bring in uh, you know, a full team in-house. Uh, so they might, they might look to partner with a, a CDO. Um, another example is a, a smaller footprint company, you know, they're re revenue generating, they've got a great product. Um, it's taking off in the marketplace. They've got, you know, growth plans, um, tied to expansion of that product line. Uh, and the team they have just can't handle the workload, right? They're starting to scale up. They want to do all these different features and, uh, they just can't tackle all these projects at once. Um, and then, of course, you have the large organizations. These are the, you know, multinational ones that, um, you know, maybe through an acquisition, they've, they've brought in some new tech or they've got a, a distributed team across multiple sites. Um, one example that, you know, typically happens, you know, fairly frequently is, is you're, you might have an issue, something on the production line or something in the field. Um, the team you have is very competent at, at what they do, but um, for some reason, they just don't understand, you know, the science behind something or they're missing an element to, to help crack the nut on what the root cause might be. Or maybe they just want a second set of eyes to look over their work. Um, so, you know, the reasons are varied, but at the end of the day, each company needs, needs more resources to achieve their goal. And, and maybe they don't have the luxury of bringing them in-house. Maybe they have to look at, outside. Um, 
I, I will say though, in, in my experience in uh, both on, on both sides of using uh, external partners and being an external partner, companies should really take pause and look inward and dig deep to understand what are you really needing, right? Everybody's under pressure of schedule and, and budgets and, and you need to make decisions quickly and you wanna impress your boss by solving a problem quickly or, or whatever. Um, but it really comes down to you really should assess what is vitally important to you in your organization and the expectations that you have of the engagement with a partner. Um, so what I what I might give you a few examples of this, you, you might just need people, right? I need bandwidth. I need people to turn the crank, so to speak. That's a different need than I'm trying to lean into a new market or a new area. I want to be on kind of the front end of this space, but I don't know what I don't know, right? The needs are very different there. Um, and then, of course, there's a, a bunch of different things that are in between that, but you get the idea of, of um, you know, those reasons. So you've talked a lot about the variety of needs for why you might consider outsourcing, but could you also tell a little bit about the different types of outsourced resources? Yes. So this, this is uh, kind of an, an evolution, I'll call it. Um, and it, it almost scales based on your need, right? I talked about the crank turning kind of, I just need head counts. Um, this is the classic approach of, you're like one or two key people away from meeting your plan, right? Being able to execute what, what you set out to do. Um, it might be somebody like a circuit board guru, right? I need a circuit board layout person or somebody to drive, you know, a, a piece of software to do some kind of modeling or something, um, whatever the reason is. You're going to manage those resources day to day. They're part of your team. Um, you're just trying to find somebody quick, right? You could certainly go in-house and post a position, full-time position, but it takes time to find the right person. Or maybe you don't want to commit to that person long-term or that position long-term. So you go out to like the aerotechs of the world or the triple crowns and, and you're trying to get some, you know, staff augmentation. This has been going on for a long time. I mean, forever and, and pretty much in any industry, right? I think you see this uh, quite a bit. Those companies that do this are, are very successful and will always continue to be. Um, the next one is the resource team. So this is, you know, you're, you've got a team, you've got the ability to do some of the work, but you're just missing a, um, a piece of uh, the holistic team, right? Like a capability or maybe it's a subsystem of knowledge, you know, like uh, uh, the classic example here is is like software development. Uh, it became popular. This kind of approach was, I don't know, maybe 20 years ago during the dot com era, where everybody wanted a you know a website, and and uh, so no one had developers in house, so they were you know scrambling to find uh, teams of resources they could hire to to fill that one kind of niche niche capability that that they were missing. Um, this, this approach is, uh, a little bit, you know, more of you're giving them some autonomy to do their job, but at the same time, you're still managing them. You're, you've got a PM on your team, program manager on your team is overseeing their work. Um, um, but effectively you're, you're going to allow them to, to execute as directed by your team. Um, I, I actually did this when I was at a company in, um, uh, my early uh, time in med devices, I, I took a position in a company that was largely mechanical focused and they decided that they wanted to create a smart product and, and they didn't have software engineering. They didn't have electrical engineering. And so I was hired to build that team. Um, and, you know, effectively what we needed to do at the time was outsource software development from the, the application side um, the firmware that was going to go on the product, we, we hired in-house for that. Um, so again, just a, an example of, of that situation. Um, 
the third one down the outsource the complete project this one is is you just have so much work on your plate you you need another team like a whole team right you're buying the breadth of the team and the depth that comes with an existing um, uh, group, right? The culture, the, the identity, you're, you're getting all of that. You know they work well together because they're already a team. Um, they tend to be a little more market specific. So if you're, if you're in med device and you're looking for outsourcing a complete project, you're gonna wanna find some folks in that space that have experience, right? where maybe some of the other ones you can kind of pull in, pull in resources from a different domain as long as you can cover their gaps, you know, for your particular need. Uh, but this one, you know, you, you kind of need to be a little more um, focused in, in the markets that you're, you're serving to make sure that, you're, that they're doing the work in, in a, a way that uh, aligns with, with what you need. And the reason is because you're, you're pretty much handing over a project to them, right? You're still you're still overseeing them, but they would typically bring the project manager, right? That's part of that team. So maybe there's some report outs and things like that. So you expect them to be able to to handle those gotchas that you know come with specifically med device development. Um, this one, this kind of uh, approach, I don't know. Maybe it's been about ten years ago it started maybe it was after the recession there was there was consolidation of companies you know acquisitions and companies were were building larger teams um but then also their uh the the venture capitalist world kind of started taking off and you're getting a lot of seed funding for for smaller companies and and uh, anyway that's my perception of when this started to come into play uh, of outsourcing the complete project specific to med device um, the last one down here at the bottom, this is, this is really um, somewhat recent. I don't know, maybe within the last five years or so. And, and, and what this is, is beyond just the, the execution of a project, right? This is like a strategic alignment between organizations um, that includes like a portfolio of projects. Um, and it's not just, hey, here's three projects I want you to execute. It's it's deeper than that. And, and there's more layers to it. it. It includes things like strategic planning and, and possibly co-investments, right? You're, you're co-developing as a true partner. Um, these would typically have things like master services agreements or steering committees, um, maybe even integrated IT systems, right? Quality management systems where you're you're having that that entire team work out of a, a common um, QMS. Um, so the takeaway here for this slide is there's a variety of approaches to fit your needs. I mean, obviously there's a lot of depth in here and we'll, and we'll go into some of that uh, for the rest of the, the webinar, but this gives you a good kind of 10,000 foot view. Yeah, seeing the evolving approach, I think, you know, you can kind of identify when each type of instance might still be applicable um, and, and thinking through and hearing the specific needs for each one was was quite helpful. Um, but going back to this, the different types of companies you mentioned, can you speak a little bit more about how you might actually consider, am I ready and do I want to go for outsourcing versus um, insourcing or, or hiring in-house, so to speak? What are some situations for, for either option? Yeah, this is the million dollar question, right? Do you hire in-house or do you go uh, outsource? Um, so I'll talk a little bit about this and, and give you some, some ideas to think about. So I mentioned you know, earlier on the previous slides around uh, getting into a new domain. This is the classic, I'm missing some knowledge. I don't have it myself. I can hire it in-house, but I, I don't even know what to look for, right? This is, I need to fill a knowledge gap with somebody who's very capable in that space. Um, within Battelle, we have a, a, a large group. I think there's about, I don't even know, 120 people in this group maybe that's specifically focused on material science. We get a lot of clients that come to us for their capabilities, right? They don't have, they, maybe their understanding of, of plastics or polymers or whatever only goes so far, but they really need to, to deep core, hardcore scientists to work on something. Um, so that's a good example, I think, of, of um, you know, you're missing a, a knowledge, um, a portion of knowledge within your team. 
The next one I'll, I'll talk about is this innovation wilderness. So this is, these are for the companies that aren't, aren't located in the Boston's or the Minneapolis or the LA where, you know, specific to med device, it can be hard to find capable resources um, in the region of your company, right? Um, obviously with, with the pandemic and working from home and all that kind of change things with the uh, hybrid or, or remote work. And that's certainly still a possibility. Um, but this is a, a real thing, right? Where, where you just can't find the right folks at the right location. Um, so that, that might be an area where, where you're looking to look outside to, to find the right resources. Uh, the next two are, are related, but slightly different. So you can't afford to hire. This is this one's a cost thing, right? You've got short-term funds. You can't commit to the full-time hire. Pretty cut and dry. Second one is you can't afford to hire wrong, meaning the schedule is really important, right? You have the ability funding-wise to bring in the right resources and to look for the right resources. But unfortunately, you're it's crunch time. You got to get you got one shot to get it right. You're going to go find some folks that, that, you know, convince you uh, that they're the right partners for you in that situation. Um, let's see too many opportunities. So this is the one that is uh, the bandwidth problem. You, 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 your project list is grown to the point where you're, you're not able to just hire one, two, three, four, five people to keep up with the demand. This is, you need to make a step change with the team that you're working with. And, and that's a, a big reason why folks outsource. Um, from our experience, just anecdotally, um, fiscal years usually seem to kick this one off. You get a bowl of some money at the beginning of the fiscal year and, and every project becomes important. And so uh, just think ahead, right? This is that Another plug for the self-reflection. If you're if you're coming up on your fiscal year and there's some rumblings around, a lot of work coming, uh, just think about what you need and and what your game plan is. Get ahead of that ahead of that curve. Um, so in contrast, to all this insourcing, right, makes sense, right? What are all the reasons that people insource? It's it's things like you're in, you're investing in your team right and the idea is it's the longer term view you're you're bringing on a resource or resources um, to pay off in the long run right you're not just focused on the short term but you're you're investing in their training you're investing in their you know onboarding into your culture maybe you're developing the next leader within your group right those are all the reasons that you would want to bring uh, new new faces onto your team um, on staff. Um, there's also the value of the bench, right? This is, you know, when, when you're uh, hand to mouth, so to speak, of, of being able to handle your work, um, having a little bit of a buffer is nice. Having a bench so that you can handle the ups and downs. I mean, this is the classic... Um, We've got projects we're trying to develop or, or create, you know, new products. And then we have a fire drill with something in production, right? And these are taking your, those fires are taking your attention off of your projects. You just need a couple of people to, to help, um, you know, buoy through those uh, ebbs and flows of demand. And then it also gives you an opportunity to mentor and grow people, right? This is, again, the long-term investment. You're really trying to, to build the bench um, uh, for efficiencies in the future. Um, mentioned this one briefly already somewhat, the integrated team. This is getting into like, you're building a culture of trust. You're, you're integrating them in day to day. Um, it's, it's really around trying to build a cohesive team. You can, you know, that's, that's kind of a, a one reason why people like to, to bring folks in house, um, which also dovetails into the next one, the control over capabilities. You're, you're getting to choose what, what exactly you want, right? You're, you're interviewing a panel of people to find the right one for your needs. You can hire exactly at that point in time. Um, you can be on the, the, tactical side of things and or you could be on the strategic side of things you could look for capabilities or or uh, growth areas of uh that you know might fill some gaps for for your current team 
Um, the idea when you hire or when you join a company or, or um, you know, have a, a employee flip from contractor to full time is, is they're, they're really loyal to your company, right? They're, they're representing your best interests in the decisions that they make um, because you're all kind of on the same team and marching to the same uh, orders or, or drum beat. Um, so it's, it's really around, you know, building a team from a culture and capabilities. You're, you're creating the bench, you're, you're growing the team around, you know, somebody to carry the torch is the next generation. Um, so those are all like the positive reasons. Um, and then everybody who, anybody who's been in industry for a while is, you're going to have some experiences that didn't go well. Right. And, and so that's the classic you've been burned before. This is a uh, fool me once kind of scenario where you tried something and for whatever reason, it didn't work out. Um, it could have been, you know, a bait and switch. You felt like they bait and switched you. If you got less capable resources than advertised, or maybe they couldn't control the scope or the risk of what you were working on or having them work on, um, which led to schedule and cost increases. Um, Another one could be, you know, it's a great design, looks pretty, but we can't build it. And I think this one is, you know, uh, unfortunately has happened before to folks. Um, so whatever the reasons are, people, you know, get, get a little uh, uh, injured on, on their past experience and don't want to go through that same painful uh, experience again. Um, but I would argue, you know, you have to learn from what, what happened before you have to, um, you know, assess why didn't it work out? Um, why wasn't, why wasn't outsourcing then? Um, why, why does it mean it shouldn't be the right approach today? And I think that's a go getting back to your self-reflection, try and figure out what didn't work, um, and make adjustments, right? How did you learn? what actually went wrong, like, you know, systems engineering in quality, we like the five whys, right? Like to really dive in to figure out um, what could have been done differently to uh, make an, an adjustment or, or not have it end up in the same way. So I don't know, Brittany, have you, have in your experience, have you been faced with, uh, you know, this, this kind of uh, choice before in in-house or uh, in or outsourcing? Yeah, I, I definitely have. And I think many, many folks on the call probably have as well. Um, oftentimes we're having to think through and deal with evaluation of what is the best approach to push a project to the finish line, thinking through how do we get where we need to, to, to be in the most efficient pathway. Um, one example that um, I recall from, from my previous experience was around um, where a project with a software component um, also required not only a software upgrade, but also a software validation. But that upgrade had a specific uh, go live, so to speak, due date of when that upgrade was going to be needed by those that use that software. Um, and, and at that company, the concern was, well, how do we get both pieces done in that timeline? Um, the in-house resources maybe didn't have the technical capability to be efficient in the validation. But if we could consider um, outsourcing a portion of that, kind of using some of those approaches you discussed or using some of the topics you just outlined here, decisioning between outsourcing and insourcing, um, the uh, one option is to potentially utilize outsourcing for that validation piece to execute it um, within that same timeline um, that would be needed to get both parts of that project done. So this is an example where actually going and including a portion of outsourcing for a part of that project would be helpful to consider um, in order to meet a critical timeline where there's two parallel paths or two consecutive paths that really need to happen in the same amount window of time, um, but maybe you don't have the resources in-house to, to completely execute it um, efficiently enough to meet that timeline. So looking kind of like you mentioned, um, outsourcing for a supplement um, in that specific example to get the end goal completed in the timeline was something that definitely helped at least achieve the goal um, and, and was something that um, made it such that the, the technical gap of getting validation done of that software um, could also be completed. So I think moving forward, let's just go ahead and assume that 
um, the company has determined that they want to want to solicit um, CDOs and they want to go ahead and get some proposals. Um, in that level of experience, what are some considerations that might be part of this type of vendor assessment for determining which CDO um, they might want to move forward with from a proposal standpoint? Yeah, um, that's a good a good question for us to to lean into. Um, so evaluating a, a contract design uh, organization usually includes creating an RFP, right? You you've identified what you need. You you create an RFP. Um, you send it out for for uh, quotes, and then you start to evaluate uh, the responses. So these are th this wordplay here is kind of the classic vendor assessment form, so to speak. You've got, um, you know, project plans. Do the project plans make sense, right? Does the schedule align with what you need? Does the budget seem to be, uh, you know, passing the SNF test? Um, if not, take a look at your RFP, right? There might be some language in there that's throwing the, the vendors off or the, the, the responses off. Um, capabilities and expertise, you know, what's the breadth versus depth of, of what's proposed? Um, what's their bench look like? Is it impressive or is it just kind of check the box? You know, that, that's some things to look at. Um, what capabilities are they proposing that they have in house? So this is different than capabilities that they might be outsourcing. So keep, keep that in mind as well. So, you know, for, for, Med device development, R and D. It's typically engineers and scientists. But what what specifically? What specialists do they have? Um, do they have the ability to do preclinical studies uh, in house? Do they have the ability to do uh, pre compliance testing in house? Um, do they have their own quality management system? You know, all all the things that kind of go into a holistic um, project. You're going to want to see if if it's truly uh, a capability that they have. And, and at what depth? Um, another one is, do they have experience with the tech you're talking about, right? This is this is like, no, I'm, I'm specifically needing an expert in, you know, whatever technology, not, not something that's kind of a stretch. Well, we kind of dabble over here, maybe we could apply it over there. Um, is the experience relevant and, and recent or is it dated? You know, tech advances fairly rapidly, although you could argue in med devices, it's slow. <laughs> but um, in industries other than med device, you know, tech advancement happens very quickly. So, um, you know, I think, you know, that's something you need to look at is, is how dated their experience is. Um, were they successful transitioning the tech to market, right? Uh, those are good questions to ask. Um, one that I think is important, it kind of goes beyond the checklist, but it's still part of that kind of a vendor assessment is how responsive were they to the process of getting the RFP or, or the proposal uh, to you? You know, did it, did everything flow through one person and they were a bottleneck or was it pretty efficient? Did, did they, did they respond to what you're asking for, whether it's written or verbal, you know, did, were you playing a telephone game where certain things, you know, you were saying something, but they were hearing it differently, right? Um, take a look at those and, and see if it's really what you asked for. And again, if not, try to figure out why, maybe go back, give them another opportunity. Um, I think one on here that, that is pretty, you know, speaks for itself as a reputation in the, in the industry. Um, is it, is it, you know, relevant? Do they, will they share references? I think those are good questions to ask. Um, locations, another one, you know, is it a barrier for some reason? Um, will they, are they willing to travel or are they, what about on-site placement? You know, those are all kind of, uh, anecdotally, you know, what you should be thinking about. Um, so I think, you know, with that, it's a pretty straightforward as far as, you know, a, a, the the vendor assessment form what the things you might be looking at but um yeah so yeah i think a lot of the the items you touched on are, are um, examples of those evaluation techniques that some that folks might think about and others that are like oh yeah that's something that's a little bit more of a stretch to make sure that in the moment during interactions with the vendors that are, are worthwhile to think about like you know responsiveness and communication because that can sometimes get lost with budget and and what they can deliver so there's some key things to consider on specifically when you're interacting with the vendors as well. 
Um, so kind of given that way to evaluate CDOs, can you share a little bit more as far as how to more deeply consider the evaluations when you are trying to decide for CDOs? Yeah, I think at the highest level, it really starts with, with your approach and how you're engaging the potential vendors, right? So this is, um, certainly you could throw an RFP over the wall, over email and get a response, but, but I would encourage folks to go beyond that, right? I, I would recommend you have in-person meetings, um, ideally at their facility. So not, not yours. I mean, you could host them. There's, there's value in that too. If, if you need to show and tell your tech or whatever, but go look at their location. Um, if you can't do that, have some virtual meetings, just the face to face allows for more depth and conversation. Um, so with that, I try to buy, boil it up into a few different key areas. This one being interest in acumen and the core of this one is you're really trying to assess how well do they understand your problem? What, what questions did they ask you during the process? Did it indicate that they really know what's going on and what your problems are? Or was it kind of superficial? You know, again, the vendor assessment form and the things we talked about in the previous slide are all important. But what I'm trying to do is dive a little bit deeper below the surface level. Um, so things like side conversations, what side conversations were had? Um, did you go to dinner the night before? I found if you go to dinner, it really like breaks the ice. You get to know people. And typically there's conversations around your problem or your need. Um, so what were those conversations like? Do you really get a sense that uh, they understand, you know, the, the domain and, and your need at a deeper level? Um, the next one is, how interesting did they find your problem or challenge? Uh, a lot of projects, you know, they have very little unknowns. And those that, you know, everything's pretty cut and dry, they're, it's execution, right? If that's what you need, that's your situation where you just need execution. This, this, these couple slides probably aren't going to, uh, you know, mean too much, but hopefully you'll take away some, some learnings from that. But this is really diving into the projects or the situations where you have a real problem and you need expertise to solve it. Um, most projects have gaps. Most projects have risks. It could be things like missing user needs. We just don't understand them. They're squishy. It could be emerging technologies. Um, you, you think it works? It works on paper. Maybe you modeled it, but we've never, you know, distilled it into a, a, a real working uh, benchtop test or whatever. Could be product features, you know, whatever the reason is, there's a lot of unknowns. And what you're really trying to gauge is, do they think that that is interesting? Do they get energized by those issues that you're having or what the problems you're trying to solve? Things like the energy in the room, were they excited? Were they curious? Were they dismissive, right? In some cases, they'll be like, no, you can't do that. And, they, and they're dismissive, but why, right? Again, think, think at that kind of uh, engagement level, trying to answer some of these questions that, that uh, you might have of the experience. Um, I, I think in my experience that if you get the right people in the room talking about the right topic, they're gonna geek out. They're gonna be excited about it. And those are the people that you want on your project, right? So assess those as you're evaluating your, your vendors that you're working with. Um, the last one's the credibility, right? I think credibility, their expertise, this goes beyond just the people, but more so like their, their ideas and what they actually work on. So with tech advancement, are they users of the tech or are they creators of the tech? It's different, right? Um, do they understand the science behind the technology? That's a key question you should ask yourself. Um, do they have the right capabilities at the right time for your project? So generalists you know, come in for the whole project, specialists come in for very specific needs. So evaluate those in their proposal, who did they include in the proposal? And, and, and did they hit the right mark at the right time? Um, 
you know, I mentioned niche roles like preclinical facilities and another one's human subject research. Um, those are all good things as far as you know, look for the capabilities that they have and what they've included in the proposal. Um, and then last, I think, you know, from an ideas standpoint, how do they develop intellectual property, both for themselves and for you, right? What's, what's that look like on, on this type of an engagement for your project? Um, so moving beyond that, you get, you've got the, the interest and acumen stuff covered. Now you're trying to look at the right process and the right people. So this is things like, how do they approach project management? Are they, do they, do they give off a perception of their administrators of project management of the X's and O's, you know, they're very good at checking a box as far as, you know, getting a status update on a percent complete or, you know, budget or whatever. Are they role players? So they're moonlighting as a PM, but really at the core, they're, they're going to be dual hatting your project as a mechanical engineer and, and a PM. Or are they coaches within the program management ranks? You know, the coaches, if you think about players versus coaches, coaches understand the game, right? They understand the strategy of, of what you're trying to accomplish. They, they see the forest from the trees. They're teachers, right? They're mentors. Um, they demonstrate what good looks like from a program management perspective. Those are the people you should be looking for that are being proposed for your project. Find the coaches. Those are the ones that are going to save you uh, from the typical, you know, project schedules never go right. You know, they're always evolving. Uh, the coaches are the ones that, that know how to handle those. Um, risk and opportunity management is another one where, um, you know, because as I mentioned, schedules never go right and projects never go well, but, but ask them about it. To ask about a project that went well, what went beyond their expectations? Give, give me an example of that. And then, you know, the, the flip side to that is, well, tell me about a project that didn't go well, right? Try to get a feel for ha what happens when problems arise. How do they handle them? Um, feel free to throw a curveball or two when you're, when you're really trying to gauge their ability to, to handle the problems that are going to come. So that's, that's really important. Can't, can't, um, emphasize that enough. Um, another thing to, to think about here from a risk standpoint or, or opportunities is are they, are they specific about things or are they just giving you generalities of the answers? Uh, a, good, a good one on this is do they recognize their own gaps, right? What on their team do they not have that maybe you need to bring to the table to be successful? That's a key piece for you to evaluate as well. Uh, better together. This is a culture fit thing, right? Who is in the room? Who did you meet? How big is their team? You know, how do they staff up? Um, how do they mentor and grow their bench, including yours, right? So this could be, um, you know, from an integration standpoint, if you're wanting to operate as a cohesive team, how are they going to make your team better? Um, and a good way to kind of evaluate that, at least I like to, is, is gauge the room. Like, what was the leader follower dynamic in the room? You know, you're, you're engaging in conversation. Was it one person that was talking the whole time and everybody else was quiet? Was everything funneling through that one person? Um, was it a salesperson that was answering all the questions, right? Or the technical folks? Um, did it, uh, uh, a nice thing I like to think about under those circumstances or that point of consideration is, does everyone on their end seem to be empowered to represent themselves and represent their company? I think that kind of speaks to the culture of the organization. Um, you know, you can kind of take that away ba based on reading the room. Um, the one thing I will mention here on this slide is you have to recognize that every company is in business to make money period, right? And you have to look past the surface level info. You have to look past the distractions. You have to uh, make sure you don't get caught up in the sales pitch side of things and really dig at that deeper level. So don't be wined and dined by, you know, the pretty 
the pretty things that they have in their lobby or the fancy lunch that they bring in. So uh, those are all great, right? You'd like to see those and like to be a part of them. But really, if you're choosing to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars or millions of dollars with an organization, you got to really dig deeper. Um, third one, this one's kind of reserved for, um, you know, special situations that I mentioned. They were at the bottom of that list that was on uh, previous slide where it's it's strategic partnerships and and this is when you're really seeking um, to understand their organization as a whole and and do the layers of their organization bring the same energy and alignment to yours across the vision the strategy the tactics um, tactical alignment is pretty straightforward right maybe their company is the one that bubbled to the top of the the proposals that you got, you you appreciated what they what they talked about, you know, in their proposal. You you engage with them well from a culture standpoint, their capabilities, like all the reasons that you would select them from a tactical standpoint. Um, if you're starting to think about a strategic partnership, look at their processes and and where do they differ from yours, and why is their way such a good way and not yours? And have that conversation, right? Understand. Is there, is there resonance here or is there friction? And try to assess that because if you're really gonna get into a, a strategic partnership, um, you wanna make sure you're not only hitting on the culture side, but the operation side as well. So the strategy layer, this is, are they actively involved in the particular technology or that product space that you are? Is it, is it complementary or competing? Right? Are they inter uh, investing internally in um, you know, the tech or are they going after external funding? Those are all good questions to ask if, if, they're, if they're stating that they are um, you know, active in that particular space. Um, and then are they interested in, in forming a strategic partnership from a, a vision standpoint? And, and what this might look like are co-investments or royalty shares or IP sharing. Um, it could include teaming agreements, right? So we, we've got uh, a partnership with a smaller company that um, we're going after some government grants together because they, we need some seed funding and, and uh, they don't have the capital right now to go after it. So we're, we're teaming with them to go after those. Um, so, Again, hopefully these, these last three slides give you a little bit of depth into uh, how CDOs can differentiate themselves and how you should look past that vendor assessment form or the proposal you know, as it's written on paper to, to judge who really is the best fit for your need. Thanks, Rick. You've covered a lot of information in this webinar and just about getting to the end of our time, actually. So is there just a quick you know, high level takeaway that you can share with the audience and then we'll leave a couple minutes left for some questions. Yeah, uh, you know, I put this in here just as a, um, you know, prompt for the audience to think about, you know, as you reflect on what I spoke about today, what, what challenges do you have? Um, Self-reflect on those challenges. That, that thought and that energy that you put into self-reflection is just as important as it is about, getting an RFP out there or evaluating vendors. Um, so, so look across all the different things that I, I spoke about and, and answer, ask yourself those questions. Um, resource need is the key, one of the key things, right? That goes back to slide 11, where you've got kind of the four different approaches. Do you just need a couple people or do you need a strategic partnership? Really try to hone in on, on what your need is not necessarily just for the project you have in front of you, but you know, look holistically. And then what are you doing today that, that maybe you should change? You know, look at the processes that you have. Maybe it's a, an SOP that's dictating how you're allowed to go solicit input. Um, should you change it, right? So anyway, just a few thoughts for folks to think about. And uh, with that, I think we're, wrap it up. Yeah. So thanks again, Rick. Um, if you guys do have questions, as Nicole mentioned, you can drop those in the Q&A chat. Um, we did have a couple of items come in, Rick, so I'll throw those out to you. Sure. Um, the first one um, is kind of related to your first question on this takeaways and question slide. 
Um, the comment was, how do we engage to explore options on a new med tech product? Um, they indicated they're out of Virginia, um, but that seems to be a, a question of engagement um, for new med tech product. What are some options and how do they engage to explore those options? Yeah, so I'm, I'm interpreting this question to be, um, how do you initially engage um, CDOs on, on a new med tech product? Uh, I think that just begins with, do a little bit of research, Googling of, of who's in this space, go to some conferences or they are good conferences where you have different uh, vendors and set up meetings. I mean, it's really as simple as that is um, just do a little bit of digging and, and reach out, ask colleagues, maybe from a different company or, or a different division of yours who they've used before um and and go that route to set up those initial engagements and and i apologize if i'm interpreting your question wrong but um great and um this is more of a comment but i think a, a worthwhile one is to see if you have an additional follow-up um it, it resonates closely to the right process right people um sometimes a contract organization may be too big for a small startup and that startup may not know from a wonderful looking website from that a contract organization that they actually aren't a good fit and they might need to move to a different contract organization. So I think that kind of hits to the wine and dine, make sure you're not seeing, you know, you can see past the pretty things. Um, but I, I thought that kind of hit home on the right process, right people comments that you shared was yeah. sometimes that you got to see behind the curtain um, in order to be able to make the right decision. And then another question that came in was uh, more Battelle focused. Can Battelle help a one person startup who hasn't uh, doesn't know what goes into an RFP? And I would say, yes, of course we can, but Rick, I'll, I'll let you uh, tag on a little bit more if you have additional input. Yeah, I think, I, I think highly of, of the way that we work at Battelle and that we, we enjoy um, working with all different kinds of, of organizations. And so an example might be the one person startup. Absolutely. Uh, another example is academia. This is an area where, you know, we've got a decent number of PhDs on our staff that came from academia and in the labs that they came from are developing really cool tech. Um, being a not-for-profit, we have the ability to, to support those small footprint companies, you know, in air quotes, if you want to call them that, that, um, you know, maybe we, we help them get a grant and we work on it together or, or maybe there's, um, you know, they just need a partner that to, to give them credibility when they're going to, to find funding. I think that's another area that it, it starts with a conversation. So if you're curious, please reach out. Um, we're happy to set up some, some calls. Yeah, and I, I think that brings us close to two o'clock. Um, as Rick mentioned, if you are interested in learning more about Patel, engaging with Patel, you can definitely reach out. Our contacts, uh, both mine and Rick, will be included in the presentation slide deck that will be shared with you. So if you have some additional questions we weren't able to get to or outside after you think about the content that Rick was able to speak to, feel free to um, email either of us. And if we can't answer the question or we need to funnel it to someone um, in a business development space, uh, we're more than happy to do so. So with that, Nicole, I'll turn it back over to you um, to kind of wrap us up for this webinar. Thanks again, everyone, for joining. Wonderful. Great content, guys. Thank you so much for your time, Brittany and Rick. Um, so I just want to hone in on that one question because someone in the Q&A is asking, no, how do I engage with the cell? So for, for that person and for anyone else on the webinar who's wondering, how, how should they reach out? I mean, my email is brooks at battelle.org. That's the easy answer. Um, it's in the slides. So when you get the email with the slides, feel free to, to pull it there. Um, go to our website. If you, if you don't remember uh, the email addresses, you can go to the website, find the, the med device solutions. Um, yeah, that's as easy as it. it, it email me, we'll, we'll set up a meeting and uh, we'll, I'll bring in the right folks. Okay, great. So there's the answer, folks. Uh, you have the right people on this webinar. So joining this webinar today was the first step. So you're getting the information you need following this webinar. So thank you again for your time. Uh, thanks for everyone joining us. I do have to give a huge shout out to Battelle for sponsoring today's content. We really uh, can't bring this expertise to our members without support of organizations like you. So thank you so much. Um, please make sure you go to massmedic.com and check out all the great events we have coming up. And we'll see you next time. Have a great day.
Thanks, Nicole.